Welcome to Terror in Tandem, a podcast about finding entertainment in the macabre. Hosted by the knowledgeable and lovable Laura and Richard Mathiason. Each episode, we discuss the horror genre, from books to film to TV and beyond. Sometimes, even from the beyond. <laughs> you can find us online at terrorintandem.com and on Instagram at terrorintandem. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Thought it might throw a little snort in there. Yeah. A, quite a big snort. You know, that was planned. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's good. Uh, my snorts are never planned. <laughs> they come when they come. Yeah. Uh, it's what I've always said about snorts and other things. So. Happy National Peanut Butter and Jelly Day. Is it? Is it really? Yeah. Okay. I love PBJs. I know you do. I really do. I mean, they're probably because it's one of the, like, the three things I can make without injuring myself. And even then, only part of the time. The average American eats 2,000 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches by the time they graduate from high school. Oh, wow. Does the average American continue eating them and taking them to work like a child well into middle age? Not not all of them. Oh, always nice to be not average, I guess. <laughs> um, the first uh, reference to peanut butter a- paired with jelly in the U.S. was in 1901. In an article in the Boston Cooking School magazine of culinary science and domestic economics. <laughs> Fake. Um, by <laughs> Julia Carter. No. Julia Davis Chandler. That's that fake school I put on my resume. Oops. Um, Welcome to Sandwich Talk, everybody. According to the peanut board, during World War II, both peanut butter and jelly were part of the United States soldiers' military ration list. Huh. And in 1968, the J.M. Smucker Company introduced Goober, a jarred product that combined alternating vertical shapes of peanut butter and jelly. Well, with a name like Smuckers. So if you're wondering how you should observe today. Oh. The first and foremost and most important obvious is eat something with peanut butter and jelly. Got it. Got it. Got it. Or you can try something different that um, is peanut butter and jelly themed like cupcakes Huh. Or pie. Ooh. Or donuts. Oh my gosh. Or pancakes. Wow. What if, like me, you're wondering why we're talking about peanut butter and jelly? Because we're recording on National Peanut Butter and Jelly Day. That's awesome. So that's why. Happy PBJ Day. PBJD, everybody. H PBJD. Now, if you're allergic to peanut butter oh. or peanuts, this is a dark day. And you day find for you. the combination of salty and sweet we horrific. Want to be sensitive. Then this leads us to our perfect segue into this week's episode. Oh. Which two, is sci fi horror. Two other things that go really, really well together. Like or peanut butter two and jelly. Things that repulse people. Terror in tandem, you and me. Exactly. See? Whoa. I'm going to, should I edit out the pause to make it sound like you answered right away? <laughs> you can do whatever makes you sleep at night. Oh. Just to please, please sleep at night. Oh, so um, yeah. sci-fi horror. That is awesome. I'm really excited about this episode. I, I have a lot to say, a lot to talk about. I can't wait to get into it. It's another one of our broad strokes episodes. It's a big topic, you know? Yeah. We're going to be taking some long strokes. And broad ones. Yeah. yeah. And big Girthy. ones. Long ones. It's This is one of our girthier episodes. Feel free to stroke at home. Yeah. Along with this episode. Okay. So for <laughs> those of you that are still listening, thank you. Um, I did change our rating to explicit material. I, I did. I did say you should do that. Yeah. I, did. I, I just, you know, in, 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 in listening to some of our past episodes... It's um, all in the interpretation. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. The amount of times I say fuck is all contextual. So uh, we are now labeled as explicit. But ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know we are the same inclusive dorks we have been for the last 40 something episodes. Just yeah, so being a little bit more honest. And with... those who don't identify. Yes. And um, 
just trying to be a little bit more honest about the filthy animals that we are. We are. So let's talk about other filthy beings. Yes, um, let's get into it. So sci-fi horror, just to give a bit of an overview and definition, mm. it's a subgenre of both science fiction and horror. Okay. And it uses the unknown, futuristic, and or scientific practices as a source of fear. The first known sci-fi horror novel was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Or published The Modern Prometheus. In 1818. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I, I did some digging um, because there's always a bit of hand-wringing about who wrote the first sci-fi. I've always thought it was uh, uh, Mary Shelley. Um, some people will point to H.G. Wells. Some people will point to Jules Verne. Um, I discovered, now, while Mary Shelley, I agree with you, most likely wrote the first science fiction horror novel, she actually didn't write the first science fiction novel. That honor most likely goes to Voltaire, of all people, who in 1752 wrote a novella, Micromega, which in uh, in French translates to tiny giant. Mm. Um, and it is about a 40 kilometer tall alien from Sirius who travels to Saturn and makes friends with a tiny scientist who's only two kilometers tall. And then the two of them just sort of toot around space together, you know, discovering things and getting into adventures. And it's quite whimsical because it's Voltaire. Mm. But I just, uh, it's actually quite sophisticated um, in its depiction of celestial bodies and whatnot and their positioning and, and, and all that, you know, especially for the 18th century. It's really interesting. Like um, it's always as long as we've been staring up at the stars, we've been telling science fiction tales, but maybe before we had a understanding of science, we just called the fantasy or magic or, you know, religion or whatever myth, mythology, whatever you want to call it. So that sounds a little bit, I mean, it sounds like a similar vibe of Project Hail Mary, the um, um, Anthony Weir book. I don't know that one. It's pretty new. Is it Anthony Weir? Is it, well, he, he's, he wrote The Martian, Andy Weir. Andy, Andy Weir. Weir. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, Andy yeah, Weir. yeah. And yeah, basically the a teacher or like these scientists and a teacher ends up on this ship Um and the whole thing is to save Earth, and he encounters this um, alien. Huh. Um, and they work together to basically help save Earth. Yeah. It's pretty... It's pretty incredible. I, I wonder if it's, it was inspired. Maybe. Um, you know, uh, but essentially, I, 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 I love the idea that in the 18th century, the mid-18th century, Voltaire wrote um, what is essentially a, a Rick and Morty. Just, you know, a couple of weirdos scooting around space and doing space stuff. So some of the ways that sci-fi horror can be represented is by using evil or amoral means to create something new. You talking the the old mad scientist or science gone amok? Yep. Um, yeah. The need to be known or to become famous using technology that those, also leads to horrific outcomes. Remember those videos from the 90s, Scientists Gone Wild? Yeah. That was problematic from the start. I know. As soon as the lab coats came off. It also includes dangerous life forms, alien monsters, and loneliness of outer space, which branches into cosmic horror, which we will do an episode on. Ooh, we will? I'm so excited about that one. There is a little bit of a distinction. Cosmic horror is sort of a subgenre of a subgenre. And just real quick to distinguish it, um, you know, its most famous practitioner, you know, godfather racist prick, um, H.P. Lovecraft. But cosmic horror specifically deals with man's insignificance mm -hmm. in the face of unimaginable forces. Like to even know a fraction of what you're facing is to lose your sanity, that kind of stuff. I did dig out some tropes, just some tropes that like jumped out to me. Okay. Um, you feel free to add your own tropes. A lot tropes. Genre. in space um so people farms what yeah people farms like um 
They Live I think and V, is, which is reptilian-like yeah, 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 aliens yeah. or otherworldly aliens or living green. as human-like beings. Okay. So they're basically taking over humans and trying to assimilate in order for world domination. Invasion of the Body Snatchers? Yep. Which uh, we just did. We did. Remake. And it was really good. Oh, so speaking of, just, just a quick aside. Hold on. One moment, please. Pause... If you right, let's go. Um, in our the movie we watched yesterday, Scream Six, yeah, which is good. Um, they talked about um, requel. They're trying to like coin that phrase. Yeah, I mean, you know, Scream Scream has always been meta. So meta now is a discussion of the new in the horror zeitgeist the legacy sequel and the requel yeah so it's the a reboot remake it's, it's not hybrid. a clear remake it's yeah. not a clear sequel it's like but it's a, a cherry picking sequel the good stuff from a yeah. franchise and ignoring the cocaine fueled stuff of like the fifth or sixth movie and just a shout out to the podcast last pod on the left Holy i shit, saw your right? poster yeah. in the scream film damn in like the first 10 minutes of the film yeah you totally poked me uh, I did. I got I got an in theater poking. So I hope in Scream Seven, Taryn Tandem poster, or bumper sticker, something will be there. Either that or I will be arrested on the set of Scream Seven with a trunk full of Taryn Tandem stickers. Mm. Um, but um so anyway, Scream Six tro- is super good. It's yeah, not it's sci fi horror, but it we'll is talk super about it. duper duper good. Um we'll talk about it. Uh so a couple of other horror tropes experiments gone wrong. Can we just talk about people farms for one more sure. second? Is that a term that you coined? No, it's a trope. It's a sci-fi horror trope. I just love it. I know. I'm just taking from the I'm pretty the sure long long list of sci-fi horror Listen, tropes. Listen, I'm just saying if we are not sponsored by People Farms, we are probably going to be in a future episode. Well, I feel like we should write a commercial about People Farms. What do you mean we should write a commercial? I will seek out their sponsorship and they will, <laughs> you know, it's just crazy. We've been doing this for a year. You should know how this works. So another trope is experiments gone wrong. Ah. So a couple of examples, uh, the fly, obviously, yeah. Yeah. Um, Battlefield Earth, where... Wait, this... hold on. Battlefield Earth? Yeah. Oh, wow. A okay. manager does experiments on a subjugated race, which ultimately results in gaining knowledge and power to wipe out your home world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, though. Sure. I mean, listen, if you can figure out any kind of fucking narrative from whatever battlefield earth is uh just a quick aside shout out to my college roommates when i was in college when we threw parties we would frequently do readings from the book of ron uh one of my roommates had this like paperback copy of battlefield earth and we would just flip to a random page out of the like 2000 pages and uh read a paragraph of completely meaningless and indecipherable bullshit from L. Ron Hubbard. And Even that was still, a... you can argue that the whole idea of Battlefield Earth as a film is an experiment gone wrong. I, you could make that argument <laughs> about a lot of things L. Ron Hubbard did or an experiment that got, went really, really well for some people. But if Scientology wants to sponsor this podcast, we are still open. Yes. And also, <laughs> on the other hand, if Xenu would like to sponsor us, we are accepting his calls as well. Well, speaking of Xenu, um, my next trope is alien abduction or alien invasion. Yikes. That's where things go, where they should. So a, a recent example of alien abduction is nope. Oh, yeah. Close encounters. I mean, nope. Yeah, um, uh, communion, yeah. Um, fire Lots. in the sky. An alien invasion, District 9. Oh, yeah, that was and good shit. And the faculty, which I am going to talk movie. about. Love that movie. I That is a an underrated gem. I am talking about it and exactly talking about that. Very, very happy that you are. And that also kind of fits into our Body Snatchers theme that we've been on for a while. Uh, speaking of which... Did you mention it in Scream 6 uh, that there was a invasion of the body snatchers? Yeah, Easter I didn't egg? mention it, but no. we mentioned There's it There's a to total each other. Easter egg in yeah. there uh, that, that fans of of the 50s version will, will, really, will really dig. Um, after the end, post-apocalyptic, zombie apocalypse um, trope, 
The Walking Dead, The Last of Us, 28 Days Later. You yeah. know, those yeah. are all. Yeah. And then Virus, Viral, mm. The Blob, The Thing. Andromeda Strain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Space I just wanted plagues. to sort of give a few just touch points on some of those sci-fi horror tropes that, you know, yeah. they're, uh, sci-fi horror encompasses a lot. Well, so absolutely there is a whole galaxy more <laughs> of, well, well done. of these tropes, but I did just want to kind of pull out a few of the, of the more um, significant ones. Well, that actually, Do you have kinda, anything to add? It, it, yeah, it plays into to what I wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, you are mentioning the tropes, and what I was thinking about is, but well, why, why is this such a natural why? fit? Wh- why, why? <laughs> Be more constructive with your feedback. <laughs> why? Um, so, why did these things go so so? beautifully together uh, and, and and why are we so afraid of space you mentioned fear of the unknown and that certainly plays a big part in it outer space is we we know almost nothing about it almost nothing um as hp lovecraft said the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown mm. um so just the very nature of of how much of it we don't know makes it intimidating now what we do know about space is almost all of it pants shittingly terrifying mm-hmm. so let's talk about space for a second um as we all know you it, it takes quite a bit to shoot a person up into space uh sometimes they explode on the way mm. which is very sad but does happen um once you get up there there's a lot you have to do to keep yourself safe safe from things like no atmosphere, uh, freezing temperatures, cosmic radiation that can literally unravel your DNA. Um, so what happens if you get sucked out into space? I mean, we've all seen that happen in a movie. There's the, the it's a trope you didn't mention is the get sucked out into space and like how long can you do that and stay alive? I'm going to be talking about it in one of my favorite space movie examples, but turns out you actually can live in space for about 15 seconds. Um, So if you shoot yourself out of an airlock, um, as, you know, one may do occasionally, especially a big old clumsy goof like me. um, So you may want to make sure you don't have any air in your lungs because you're getting placed into a vacuum. There's no Mm -hmm. atmosphere. And as we've all heard, nature abhors a vacuum. So what will happen is in order to achieve... So do cats. Yes, they do. (laughs) And everything else. But um, in order to achieve homeostasis, it will rip the space, will rip the air out of your lungs, which is a nice way of saying your lungs will explode. Uh, The other thing will happen is any liquids will immediately evaporate, evaporate, which is another nice way of saying your eyeballs will explode. How do you rid your body of air? Well, you, if you're going to get sucked out of an airlock, Blow all the air out of your lungs and cover your eyes as tightly as possible and try to get back inside as quickly as possible. Now, within 15 oh, seconds... Oh, you're talking about just trying to survive. Yes. Within oh, 15 okay. seconds, uh, you will lose consciousness because you're not in an atmosphere anymore, which means there's no more oxygen traveling to your brain through your bloodstream. So you'll just pass out. Um, you know, screaming, but there's no atmosphere, so no one can hear you scream. And there's no air in your lungs, so there's nothing to scream with. Now, you won't freeze right away. Like anyone who saw, it was that really shitty movie with Tim Robbins, Mission to Mars, I think it was called, something, something like that. But anyway, he takes his helmet off and like freezes immediately. It, it wouldn't happen that quickly. You would eventually freeze solid and, and just be a meat popsicle, but it would take 12 to 26 hours or so. And that is a complicated, has to do with heat convection um, outside of atmosphere, and that's that's a different podcast. We're not meant to live in space. No, no. Now let's talk about what's out in space. Mostly nothing. 85% of the universe is thought to be comprised of something called dark matter. And no one knows what that is. Uh, there is the uh, supermassive black hole at the center of the universe, which is billions of times the mass of the sun, distorts 
is has a gravitational field so strong it distorts mass, gravity, light, and time. So look, I could go on and on. Uh, everything out there is terrifying and will kill you. And even if you're in a safe environment in space, if you stay out there too long, the lack of gravity will lessen your bone density and you'll just get real brittle and die. Yeah. So, yeah. Space is scary it without is. having to do anything else. And then there's all the aliens and shit. And even when, like, they come to Earth or Ramming things their... come to Earth or experiments happen on Earth. I mean, sci-fi horror isn't just about space or no, aliens. No, 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 no. It, it, it's about science. Yeah. Yeah. It's about all the other things that I mentioned, mm. like people farms. Well, that's and the other experiments gone wrong. The other thing viruses. is there's the um, the inherent human fear. And I think we have seen this a lot in the pandemic years of there's that sort of like uneasy alliance with the brilliant. Now, the, the, the masses, we rely on brilliant people to innovate and make medicines and keep us safe. But those same people with the capacity to preserve and, you know, save lives also have the capacity to create viruses and bombs and nuclear weapons and they do so uh that's why you you know you see that so often and in real life there's often a wariness mm -hmm. um you know somebody with the same qualifications could work at a children's hospital or work at a bioweapons research facility right. you know um really depends well, I say we take a break and then when we come back, we'll get into some um, filmatic examples of sci-fi horror. I love it. It's been a long road to growing the perfect clone and a bumpy one at that. Sure, you've made mistakes. The path to greatness requires breaking a few clone eggs after all. But now that you've got your genetically identical assistant in place, the question remains, what to do with all the hideous corpses of your failures? Well, why not call Boys from Brazil Clone Disposal? Using our patented clonoscopy procedure, we'll terminate and extract any remaining biomass from your life tubes, leaving behind a clean lab with a fresh lavender scent. At Boys from Brazil Clone Disposal, all of our equipment is powered by biofuel, we use every part of the discarded clone meats to keep our carbon footprint neutral. Or, for an added fee, we can render your discarded husks down into nutrients for your viable experiments. So skip the muss, skip the fuss, skip the staring into your own face as you navigate the murky ethics of purging your infant duplicates. Call Boys from Brazil Clone Disposal and let us sweep up your malformed homunculi under the rug so you can get back to mocking God. This is a fake ad for a fake product on a horror-themed podcast. Do not clone humans or hire people to dispose of the cloned humans you should not have made. Ooh, we're back. Um, so I wanted to jump into some um, of um, the, just some examples of films through time that defy time. And science. All right. Um, so I wanted to start with V. Oh, I love V. I want to start with the miniseries, uh -huh. the 1984 miniseries, and also talk just briefly about the TV series in 2009. So um, we talking with, with Mark Singer and Robert Englund, the original. Yeah, it's Faye Grant cast. and Michael Ironside, too. I know, I know. It's so good. So after Liberation Day, following a red dust bacteria, the humanoid lizard aliens develop a resistance to the bacteria and try to take control of Earth. And some humans are helping. Collaborators. And then, so this series, uh, this it was a mini-series. I think it was like a two-part mini-series. Um, it was a phenomenon. It I was. I remember I was a little kid and... It was, uh, you know, before, back in the days when you had to watch things when they were on, like people yeah, gathered around, like stopped what they were doing. They blocked off time. Like they, the they, old radio show. Not like for real. You, you had to be like, I can't do this tonight because I'm watching V. Yeah. 
So, I mean, we're also talking about in a time where you had in a um, land. Star Trek and the X-Files. Oh, no, this is way before X-Files. I know. I'm talking about in a time. Of, yeah, 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 yeah. But Star Trek and what's the other one? Not X-Files. That's not what I meant. Twilight Zone. Yeah, yeah. So you're already having these types of experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and then they remade this uh, concept into a TV show that came out in 2009 and ran for like three or four seasons yeah like uh, marina Baccarin was in it marina right? Baccarin, yeah. elizabeth mitchell yeah, yeah and morris chestnut oh. um and that i mean it sort Beautiful, of had man. the same vibe an alien race that arrives on earth to help but slowly reveals they want domination and they've become even more enmeshed and powerful in society and it was definitely like a polished version a more um colorful uh produced version yeah but it was also because it was network tv and they like it was still back in the day when they had to make like 20 something episodes a season there's just like a lot of like okay you probably could have done this in half the amount of episodes well it's serious it's 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 really interesting um because in in 1984 and then again in 2009 you think about how um society uh, feels about xenophobia i mean i know xenophobia is always existing yeah the idea of the other and oh is that like that is that still a problem in um, america which i think sci-fi horror especially has to toe the line on absolutely i mean that was a, a, a lot of uh getting back to old howard phillips himself um unfortunate a lot of his unfortunate uh prejudices that came through in his writing were using the allegory of invaders from the stars for immigrants yeah um, right yeah i mean even the term alien you know illegal alien that's Absolutely. been like thrown around a lot yeah. a lot of people use like extraterrestrial and you know when you talk about stuff like invasion of the body snatchers or v you know in, but invasion of the body snatchers came out Around the time of the Red Scare in the 50s, V yes. came out in the Reagan years yes. in the 80s where we were all afraid of the Russians still. Correct. Um, you know, and like people acting I like guess, us and like talk about spies. remakes. It was like yeah, the exactly. height of the spy yeah. game too. Spies Like Us had just come out and everyone was really afraid of Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase. Uh, doctor, 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 doctor. Um, so, I mean, those are just, you I know, love some... V. TV examples that they, I really made an impression on me when I was watching the films. I thought it was really great. When they pull off the people When they mask, pull off their people yeah, masks. And, and you see the, the, the lizard faces. That was fucking amazing. Because They Live was one of my, and still is, mm. one of my favorite um, John Carpenters. And it's really about you don't know the people that are among you. And you can really think about that on a, like a deeper psychological level. Um, I would say now that people's political affiliations and opinions are all out there on like stickers and bumper stickers. Oh, and people love stickers. And yeah. And social media postings it's and things really, like that. It's really, really important that you, you sort know of see the underneath, what I'm thinking. their underskin. Yeah, you see yeah. that already revealed. I know. But, you needed special sunglasses in yeah. John Carpenter's imagination to see that. And now you just need a, a smartphone. Or just to go outside. Yeah. I know people are like. People really, are telling you who they are. I so guess pay the, attention. I guess I recognize the irony. We, we are hosting a podcast. But yeah, like I, I pass a lot of yeah older men. I mean. Who really, really like stickers. They just love stickers. Yeah. I guess it's just a love of stickers. Sure. Of a kind. I mean, we have stickers. You can use ours if you want. So, can I talk about a movie? Sure. I'm going to talk about a really, really, really good movie. It uh, it came out in 1997. I'm talking Event Horizon. Mine came out in 1997. Then I'm going to talk about next. That was a good year. Um, so this is directed by Paul W. S. Anderson, who I'm going to level with you. Not a big fan. Uh, I have seen a lot of his movies. I just. Usually doesn't work for me, but damn, Event Horizon is fucking great. So it's got a really stacked cast. We've got Sam Neill, Lawrence Fishburne, Kathleen Quinlan, Jolie Richardson, Jason Isaacs, Sean Pertwee. It is 
just filled with cool people. Uh, long story short, Sam Neill is a scientist who created, invented faster than light travel on a ship called the Event Horizon. So it seven years ago, the Event Horizon disappears on its inaugural journey through the warp or whatever. Sounds like an experiment that's gone wrong. Yes. So uh, seven years go by, it reappears. Lawrence Fishburne leads a team uh, along with Sam Neill to find this now abandoned ship and find out what went wrong. Experiments that have gone right. Now when they, not not quite, because when they <laughs> get on the ship, everyone starts to hallucinate and go crazy. Experiments and, have gone wrong again. Yeah, this it's a roller coaster. So, uh, you know, what ends, it ends up happening is um, this crazy cool looking warp drive um the visuals are really great in this movie is it, it's actually a portal to hell so it literally sends the crew to hell um and lawrence fishburne you know it's got to blow it up before it can open up a portal to hell and sam neill turns into a, like a hell priest and it is really gory now this movie it was butchered by the studios they they really jumped in and cut a lot out and unfortunately this is the pre-digital days so it was only captured once yeah there's a there's always been this movie's been surrounded by myths that there's you know missing footage out there and i I, i've seen some there's like grainy footage that you can find on youtube but unfortunately it seems like we're never getting a director's cut of this one it's like the only Paul W.S. Anderson movie that I really, really would love that for. Uh, I don't mean to like diss him this hard um, because this is legit one of my favorites. Um, but despite that, um, it did, it bombed at the theaters. <laughs> it did achieve a cult following and amazing success on DVD and is considered uh, kind of a modern sci-fi horror classic. I love it. I love it the hell out of it it's got a really good monologue uh with Lawrence Fishburne talking about fire in in zero gravity which mm. is like a classic it's frightening it's very cool um well there must have been something in the studios in 1997 because this movie is a victim of the same thing um and there isn't really the uh so the director and this is why I'm bringing this up the director's intended ending never was captured on film bummer there is a director's cut of this film which this is the one that i'm recommending okay is guillermo del toro's 1997 mimic mimic yes so, which i saw in the theater and it well kinda, that's the theatrical cut it well the theatrical cut kind of sucks shit so it's starring mira sorvino jeremy northam josh brolin f murray abraham and charles s dutton Butcher, and uh, we should mention uh, that this movie was uh, hacked to pieces by our favorite piece of shit, Harvey Weinstein. Yep, Yay. exactly. Well, Mira Sorvino yes. and her um, experiences with yes. Harvey Weinstein are super, um, you know, why yeah, whatever keep, happened to Mira con- Sorvino? Let's keep in context that was worse. Yeah. Yes. That if you ever wonder what happened to her. He oh, like did. where did she go? He yeah. did. Yeah. Deeply abused and traumatized by a and literal he monster. And blackballed her. Yeah. Yep. Um, also, <laughs> R.I.P. R- R- Paul. Uh, he just died like a year or two ago. Yeah. yeah. So just a brief synopsis. Mira Fuck Sorvino you, and Josh Brolin are investigating an infestation of giant cockroaches I living for- under New York City. Got Josh Brolin was in that movie. The original ending. So let me let me back up. Um the the ending of the film is basically like the theatrical ending and the ending of the film is that um, it's a happy ending. The scientists come in, Hooray. they kill off the only male cockroach, yeah, and it's, it's blow up giant the rest. bugs that look like a guy. Yeah, they in a can trench coat. mimic humans and become humans. It looks like a guy with a hat on. So the original ending that Guillermo del Toro intended. And the studio would not allow him to make was that he wanted the the last male insect to um, in its final mimic to become a human and to point to Mira Sorvino's character and say, leave. Mm. 
but the studio was not happy with that idea and so they made it yeah be a happy ending so although well, you're not ever going to get to see that originally intended ending i would say to watch the director's cut because it is scary yeah and let's just say uh one of the people in that story is going to die in jail and the other one has gone on to win an academy award and is still making dope yeah, movies we're, we're, we're talking about the, the the studio assholes here yeah that fuck this movie idea up. yeah yeah explicit um, <laughs> we're just trying to earn that hey tipper gore are you listening put that e right on there it's, uh, um, that's for all of our fucking 50 year old listeners yeah so i uh, i love that um my next one is 1980 98 so if you have one later than that let no me go next. my next one is 1997 nice yeah is it it was a year it was 1997 first off as someone who was around at that time was a good year. I really like 1997. I was a fun age doing fun things and fun things were happening. So my next one is a, it's a Canadian film. It's a low budget, but it's a cult classic. And it was the debut of a director who's gone on to do a lot more since then. Vincenzo Natale. I am talking about 1997's Cube. Oh, yikes. Cube is awesome. So um, Cube, right? Cube is uh, a group of people. Um, including uh nicole de boer from the last season of deep space nine and uh one of my favorite character actors david hewlett who fans of star Trek stargate sg1 and atlantis will know um and a bunch of other people they wake up in this weird room and there's it's a cube shaped room you know equidistant every wall is the same uh, and every wall has an exit and written around the exit is some sort of math problem, essentially. So it's hmm, it's got like an escape room. It is essentially an escape room. Twenty years before escape rooms became like a bougie thing for people to do. So this doesn't sound like a fun situation. Well, though. it doesn't this sound is like the a kind volunteer. Of, no, because if you get the problem wrong, you get you know. Um, bifurcated or splashed with acid or, you know, dispatched in increasingly gross ways. Now, um, it's high concept, low budget, some pretty good special effects for, for the time and for the money. Some of the acting's a little uh, rough around the edges, but it is a cult classic for a reason. It's really, really tense. It's got a cool ending, a little twist. Um, narratively, it's not really explained what they're doing there, how they got there, or even what there is. But it's so claustrophobic and atmospheric and well done. It was um, not a commercial hit, but like I said, a cult classic, enough that it got a sequel and a prequel. And it's been talks of a remake for a long, long time. I'm sure it'll get remade at some point. But Cube is a really good example of it's 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 got uh all the you know the gore and the tension that you want out of a horror movie but the fear here is really about the fuck are we doing here yeah. how did we get in this horrible place i mean there's the this the science element of this these torture traps and whatnot they're really sophisticated and this cube itself is probably alien in, in nature um, they're like in each room is a cube that leads to another room that is a cube and they're inside a gigantic cube that's made of many, many cubes. So, <laughs> but um, I, uh, I, I highly recommend it, especially the original. Um, it's pretty gross. It's pretty cool. And um, I just, I, I, you know, Vincenzo Natale went on to do Splice, which was really awesome. Right. Most recently, I think he did In the Tall Grass, which was, uh, yeah, yeah. okay. But um, Cube, 1997, that was a banger. So I'm going to move on to 1998. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to re-mention it now, which is The Faculty. Oh, yeah. By Robert Rodriguez. Love that movie. Starring Elijah Wood, Josh Hartnett, Usher. Yeah. And Selma Hayek. Uh, Clay and Duvall. And Neworth. Who did you say? Clay Duvall is in it. Yeah. I mean, it's got a great cast. It's got like a real 90s cast, too. Yeah. John Stewart's in it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Robert Patrick, not, you know, Robert Patrick yeah, is in the, it. Yeah, the, the T-1000. Um, Famke Jansen. Yeah. 
You said Clea, right? Clea I did. Duvall. I did. I did. Yeah. It's um. So I I remember that movie because uh, I was basically the same age as all those people, and well, the the student people, and I went and saw it in the theater, and it was uh, really awesome. Yeah. So it's uh, Kevin Williamson, I who know. I know you're not the the like a Kevin Williamson stand, but I have feel like Kevin Williamson really sees me. <laughs> he makes content for me. Oh goodness! Is I that mean, who, the screen that who's movies, been texting you, Dawson's Dawson's Creek. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, faculty. He, he did that um, Kevin Bacon show, didn't he? The following, the one with uh, James yep. Purefoy. That was pretty good. It was. I, I had hope for that. Yeah. Um. So the faculty is also has a cult following. Um. It's about a high school where students are convinced that their teachers are controlled by aliens. Like. All of us were yeah. at one point. Yeah, for sure. And the the best it's part, I think, of no the film. Other, it, it's before you realize that their behavior is most likely due to depression and alcoholism. Yeah. I mean, the best part, though, is really it's like an anti-system rebellion type film. And oh, yeah. It's, it's like Rebel Without a Cause with Space Yeah, thugs. fighting against traditional learning yeah. styles and asserting individualism. Yeah. And the music. Which was a big thing in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> And the music really reinforces this. Another brick in the wall and yeah. Stay Young by Oasis. Yeah. Uh, I just, I really think that it has that sort of, um, if you're not like super into sci-fi, it, it, but you like horror or you like, you know, teen yeah. horror drama, it has all that. It's funny. It's got a it's really weird. good message that, yeah. um, you know, if you want to defeat aliens the trick is uh do drugs right um which you know we've always recommended at terror in tandem uh, you know you see some aliens try drugs uh, it should just be the first thing yeah <laughs> why not drugs sure um <laughs> they're also i mean it's it's uh now you remember he hides them in like disposable pens like that weird cocaine that he sells that's like speed or something josh hartnett yeah, 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 no, I know. It's I just, like, I'm not putting like, that drug up my nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's the way that they... Um, and it's like, um, aliens are taking over. Like, but that's the, are you That's the way me? that they, they test each other is by snorting it because the aliens can't stand to be desiccated and this, this like, you know, dehydrates you, so... Yeah. Yeah. And it, it takes place in, like, a Midwest town or a town in Texas or something like that. And, again, it's humor it's silly but it's also like serious and there's a little they really rely on each snatchers. other and overtake the faculty it's and it's violent it is yeah it is it's bloody yeah you know i mean honestly this was from a more innocent time where uh you know we could have yes. this kind of stuff happen in a school but you really can't now because uh, it's yeah like it might it, 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 your your attitude over watching uh, you know, all the actors are obviously older, but um, it it just depends on what you're comfortable with, I guess. Yeah. But all right. I love that movie. Um, I saw it in the theater. I had a blast, and I'm glad you recommended it. I was totally forgot that I really wanted to talk about Annihilation, so I'm just going to talk about it. Um, Why don't you just put some notes together? No, and I'm I just can gonna go no. on to my next notes? one, which we're is not, the year 2000. We're not we're not doing we're not doing any of that. We're just jumping right into it. We're talking annihilation, ladies and gentlemen. Both the 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 uh, the book by Jeff Vandermeer, which was part of his Southern Reach trilogy, adapted beautifully into a film, uh, written and directed by Alex Garland. And we're big Alex Garland fans here. Um, we are ex machina. Um, men. Ex Machina is amazing. Yeah. So Annihilation is um, both the book and the movie. It deals with essentially um, a, a section of land in the South basically has become like cordoned off. And anything that goes in there has its DNA like wildly altered. Cordyceps. No, it's, it's, I know. It, it, I'm just kidding. No one really understands why. So they keep sending, there's this, this clandestine organization that keeps sending teams in and, um, in annihilation, they send in a team and it's, it's made of all women and their job is to find the last team. Um, so talking about the movie version, Natalie Portman plays the, the, the lead scientist. She does a really, really great job, uh, of playing this character who is 
much, much more comfortable with science and nature than she is with people and relationships. Now, she's on this team both for her expertise in biology and, you know, uh, closed ecosystems, which this essentially is, and also because her husband, played by Oscar Isaac, is the only person from the last crew to make it out, only he doesn't remember anything. Um, so he must like Oscar Isaac then, because he was also in Ex Machina. Yes. Yeah, they do They do coll- uh, seem to have a good collaboration. I mean, shit, Oscar Isaac is great in everything. Even even stuff that's not good, he's I'm good so in it. I'm so sad that he's not going to be in the next Dune. I did not like that death of his. Yeah, you didn't read the book, right? Oh, yeah. he comes back? No, no, no. No, I always knew he wasn't. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, Paul, yeah, Leto Atreides. Yeah. Anyway, sorry about that. Um, spoiler alert for a 60-year-old book. Um, so anyway, Annihilation is um, its a really good example of sci-fi horror because it, it has the mystery of, uh, especially the book, things are kept ambiguous and vague. They're kept a little strange. Um, it's a lot more of atmosphere, but it's really the idea that your own DNA can be co-opted and rewritten, that you can be changed from within into something else, that life is not necessarily good. You know, the continuation of life doesn't really take into consideration your individual life. So there are a lot of twists and turns. It's got um, one of the scariest uh, things in it, um, Poor um, Gina Rodriguez uh, has a run-in with a, a, a wild boar that screams like a person. Yikes. Because it used to be. Um, so, yeah, it's got a great ending. The the um, The movie differs very much from the book in its ending, but it's still really, really good. The book has two sequels that are quite different. It switches characters, and it switches points of view, and it's a lot more straightforward. The first book is my favorite um, because it is so, it's just written in such a mysterious way that you are discovering things at the same pace as the protagonist. Mm. So you, 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 there's no dramatic irony. You're not, a, you're not 10 steps ahead. You're not ahead. in the know. No, you are just as confused as she is confronted by things no one has ever seen before. And, you're learning whatever she's learning at the same time she's learning it. So it's it's just a really good book, Jeff Vandermeer. Um, and and a, a modern classic, honestly. The movie is scary and gross and really sticks with you. Awesome. Yeah. Um, the, don't rewrite my DNA. <clears throat> I don't want that. The next mention of mine is Pitch Black. What? Yeah. Directed by David Tuohy. Uh, from the year 2000 starring uh, Vin Diesel, uh, Rada uh, Mitchell, Riddick. Keith David and Claudia Black, yeah. my co-host loves oh, so Claudia much. Oh, Black, love her so much. Um the synopsis is that a space transport crashes on a desert planet. Speaking of Stargate. <laughs> Sorry. There are a few survivors and they have to find food and water while they also need to keep in mind a dangerous convict, Richard B. Riddick. I is, forgot that he like is their charge. I fucking forgot. I just thought his name was Riddick, like Sade or Madonna. No, Richard B. Riddick. Richard B. Riddick? Yeah. No way. It takes away some of the power. Uh, I know. A little bit. Yeah. Or Dick Riddick. Dick Riddick here. Um, Ooh. Dicky Riddick. So they're they're being haunted by a flesh-eating, bloodthirsty creature, yes. creatures yes. that only come out at night, and they're about to deal with a month-long ap- uh, eclipse yes. that's going to take out all the suns. Oh, yes. And so they have limited weapons and light sources, and the crew is forced to rely on Diesel's Riddick and his augmented eyes that allow him to see in the dark. Yeah, and his muscles. And his big bulky. This movie is scary, legit it's, scary. It's really, no, it, listen, I'm, I'm joking. I, I, I'm joking because it's Vin Diesel, but it is legit. It is, it is. probably his best movie. In my yeah, opinion, agreed. Um, Which is why I'm bringing it up, and it's the best Riddick. In yeah, my yeah, it too. is. A, it is a series, and you know what? Honestly, good on Vin Diesel. He like 
when he when he's in a series, he's family. He, he like <laughs> he, he 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 does live his life one quarter mile at a time. <laughs> but um, you know, he definitely is a passionate advocate for his own work. So yeah, I'll, I'll say that. I mean, so a really lot of it takes place. Vin, Di- Vin Diesel really likes Vin Diesel movies. Who does? Vin Diesel. Oh, yeah. Um, a lot of this film takes place in lower light. So it's not a bright movie. It definitely captures the atmosphere of what like a desert yeah. um, planet would be like. Yeah. Um, they're wrapped, you know, the yeah. wind. Yeah. Um, and... Again, there's a couple of scenes, especially when they have like, I don't know if they're flares. Yeah, the yeah, flares. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it plays with that, light really well. It does. Yeah. And, and the also, creatures themselves are, are like dark, dark black. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You don't see the creatures too much, but you do see his uh, augmented eyes. And like when he's you got do these... see them, they're great. They ha- it's a really good creature design. They're scary as hell. Yeah, it really is. Um, so, you know, definitely check that out because it is now, it's about be- landing on a planet and you are the aliens to yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're, and they're, they're protecting they're the invaders. themselves and they're, con- yeah. uh, their, you know, land. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a great example. I love Pitch Black. Um, and you know what? They're, they did just announce that they are finally making a fourth one. Um, so I'll totally see it. Awesome. Yeah. Really Tendiwe, awesome. uh Newton and Carl Urban were in the second one. That's pretty cool. Even if the movie wasn't as good. So, yeah. Do you have more? I have two more. I mean, you know, there are millions of examples. Killer Clowns <laughs> from Outer Space, which we, we talked about a little in our comedy. Yeah, or, of um, course there's some examples. You know, the I'm going to talk about a couple of more specific examples. I'd so love to do hear Do you it. have any, a couple more specifics? I would like to hear yours. Okay. So you're going to have to add that, all that out. It's so echoey and it's so I don't so know weird. why. Okay. Um, Under the Skin from 2013. Oh, oh God, that movie is fucking, that's one that stays with you. Directed by Jonathan Glazer and it's based on a novel uh, star, scar, <clears throat> starring Scarlett Johansson and Jeremy McWilliams. And an alien entity inhabits a young woman who roams Scotland in search of human prey, male human prey mostly. Um, She seduces men and they're drugged and then they're consumed. And she uh, begins to see hmm. herself as human through this like whole self-discovery process and trying to pretend she's human. Um, But it's really complicated. Yeah, she's not... I mean, is she evil? She's doing evil things. Yes, she's evil. But like, is she doing these things because that's how her species right. survives? Or is she doing them because she is malicious and derives pleasure from it? That's not really Is explained. that even a definable quality of yeah. this race of aliens? As an aside, Jonathan Glazer, not a horror director. This is his no. only horror movie. He directed... The incredible Sexy Beast with Ben Kingsley and Ray Winston. Uh, check out Sexy Beast. R- ben Kingsley plays is, one of the all-time the greatest beast. villains. Um, under the skin, though, it it. I mean, I've never had a movie so much. What is it, onomatopoeia that actually gets under your skin like this? There, yes, it's so. It's an incredibly stylish movie. Slow there, burn. The use of color. Um, and also the lack of color in some yeah. instances. And also her the... ability to, you know, as an actress, she is beautiful. But also, you know, she's trying to be human and it's so clumsy. Yeah. An actress who is human trying to be human like not yeah act not no human, i but trying I, to act human listen i like she does Scarlett a great Johansson. job i like her jumping off buildings and blowing things up and fighting space aliens that's all great but every once in a while she does remind you like in um uh what was it run rabbit run jojo rabbit jojo rabbit yeah in, like in jojo rabbit 
or in Under the Skin that she's also lost in translation. A very, very talented. She's an dramatic incredible actor. actress. Yeah. And this is definitely one story. of the standouts. And it also has that amoral, like yeah. you said, is this a bad an evil entity or is this just their nature yeah i mean is a lion for survival evil or is it just doing what lions do and And you encroached on its space yeah no it's 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 an awesome movie and very very scary and once you once it's revealed what is happening to her victims it, it it leaves you feeling kind of sick inside yeah it's it's a fucking it's a banger. It's yeah. it's a real like yeah. I love it. I'm surprised you liked it. I did. I liked it a lot. It's so disturbing. I like disturbing things. Obviously, mm. I'm part of this podcast. Married to married to this uh, thing. And then my last mention is going to be a quiet place. Fantastic. 2018, Shh. directed by John Krasinski, starring John Krasinski and Emily Blunt. We love a yeah. husband and wife team doing yeah. things. Yeah. Um, so it's obviously a seemingly indestructible alien population has destroyed the earth. Yes. Arrived by, uh, as you find out in a quiet place too, via asteroid. Yep. Um, and the characters have to remain as quiet as possible. Emily Blunt is pregnant oh, yeah. and she also has a couple of kids already. And Which is already horrifying. Yes. And she's trying to, like, protect her family. Um, John Krasinski is, like, the most resourceful DIY guy ever. Yeah, that you can tell they've been living in this world of survival for many years. Yeah, for a while. They're, they know yeah. things well and they have how rules. to move. Yeah. Um, and he's, you know, he's emerged as, like, this incredible director. Yeah, no kidding. Definitely tense. It really does have that, you know, what we've talked about a lot lately with the emergence of horror really having that deep um, emotional connection. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's a f- movie about family. Yeah. Oh, well, the survival of family. Yeah. It's also PG-13. Yeah. And it's, it's heartbreaking and tragic and heartwarming and... Lots of sacrifice and lots you, of you really do of, connect with the the characters. The sequel's also very good. Um, there's a uh, they're building out like a whole, you know, whatever universe. But um, uh, Michael Sarnowski, the director of Pig, is directing the next oh. installment. Um, and then John Krasinski's coming back, I think, for a third movie because it's going to be a prequel. Yeah, it's going to be like a or like a side movie, you know, about a different group of people or a different person. But yeah, I mean, the second one sort of teased out like the, the yeah, days the, that it actually happened. And and that there are uh, because civilization is ended and there, it focuses so much on the family. The second movie is the first time you see like, oh, there are other people also survivors, you know, and yeah, it, it, it expands it a little bit, but still keeps it sort of an intimate tale of, of this one family. Awesome. The fucking aliens are super scary. They and just are. the they're idea huge. that huge. They're yeah, if you if you step on a twig, that's it. Yeah. You know. Or well, and like fart. if you have a baby it would and be the me. baby cries. Oh, that scene mm, is the rough. way that it's dealt with in um The Last of Us. The, no, a uh, Quiet Place 2, the yeah. way she oh, deals yeah, with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. also scary in and of itself. Yeah. Ooh. So, I think we're going to wrap this all up by just giving a quick I got to well Top three. All of our billionaire f- uh, friends, uh, we're going to get in our penis-shaped rocket and go to our space party. Um, and we're going to bring our three favorite things. One book, one TV show, and one movie. Sci-fi horror? Sci-fi horror. Mm-hmm. You go first. So for movie, I'm going to go with Alien. The ultimate uh, in space, no one can hear you scream. But uh, don't let that tra- stop you from trying. Honestly, just keep screaming. Alien, it's it's the granddaddy. It is the best. I'm talking the first, the Ridley Scott, you know, 19, was it 1978, I think, um, introduces Ellen Ripley, introduces Ash, the, an- the evil android, the face huggers, the chest bursting, H.R. Giger's incredible penis-shaped alien monsters. You know, it, it is... 
so iconic. It spawned a million sequels, some of which are good, some of which are not as good. Um, and it is so scary. The first movie is claustrophobic and tense and gory um, and just really, really satisfying. It's a, it's almost a perfect film, in my opinion. Well, my movie that I'm bringing with me on the penis rocket <laughs> that I do love to ride um, is John Carpenter's The Thing. Nice. I mean, <laughs> how could I not? Yeah. Um, Jeff Jeff Bezos. Antarctica, Winter, um, you know, scientists on a research station dealing with something that comes to get them something that comes to get them does it get them all do they get it that's left up to your own imagination nice nice so next is book or tv at the mountains of madness um hp lovecraft 1931 um First serialized in Weird Tales, which is one of those cool pulp magazines from that time. Um, so it's essentially about, you know, a group of scientists and archaeologists and geologists that go to the Arctic um, and find like an ancient hidden civilization under the glaciers and that worshipped elder gods like Cthulhu and horrible things happen the deeper they drill. And it's just a classic. And... You mentioned Guillermo del Toro earlier. For, gosh, at least 20 years now, his unmade passion project has been an adaptation of At the Mountains of Madness. Mm -hmm. It's one of Lovecraft's longer works. He mostly did short stories. This is almost novel length. Um, it's a fantastic story. I hope del Toro gets a chance to make it and make it his way uh, because I think it would be really, really cool. But it's got... Yeah, it, it was a definite inspiration for The Thing, um, The Thing from Another World and, and the Carpenter remake. It's It's got, you know, frozen horror, elder gods, ancient magic, um, losing your sanity, cosmic horror, blood on the ice. It's, it's all good. So At the Mountains of Badness, that would be my book. My book is going to be The Passage by Justin Cronin. Oh, goody. Um. I think it was published in 2010. You read it the night before our wedding. Didn't I did. You? I read it the night before we got married and technically into the early morning of the day <laughs> we got married because I couldn't stop. Because I had read it and I was like, you need to read this book. And I'm like, I'm not supposed to see you. Um, so it is part of a three part series, but I am just recommending the first novel. You can read them all. And I know it's a TV show show on fox or was i forgot about that with mark paul gosler it lasted like three seconds yeah. yeah um just read the book the passage it's uh near future um apocalyptic post-apocalyptic world Rout -rout. overrun by zombie vampires oh, and they want to infect and it's a highly infectious virus um and it follows a girl who is really like one of the hopes of the future. You know, essentially she sets out or <clears throat> Cronin sets out to have her save the world. What it's I like really about great. It it's like scientific. It's U.S. government experimentation gone wrong. It's vampire. In, uh, definitely morally questionable. Good quote unquote good guy yeah pa uh, a patient zero scenario it takes, a lab yeah I, that's uh, pretty very scary, scary too. I, um, it's very scary there is a the, the 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 opening chapter of the book is in epistolary form and it is yes. very scary yes i will never forget that um it also it takes place in two different timelines yeah that it switches back and forth the which is really interesting and the post yeah it's really yeah. so it's a little like before and after um like directly before and then way after so it's uh it, yeah the passage rules yeah justin cronin i remember when it came out it was an early exit people weren't using the term elevated horror but people were describing this as literary horror and i remember being like 
why don't you stuff that okay this it's a, all literary this you're was just a, a snob. book that i chose for my book club to read which was very different than the books that anybody else had chosen and i know people were apprehensive but many of the people that read it said it was one of their favorites yeah so. that was before they ran you right out of book club no no <laughs> well that's awesome i love the passage so what's your TV show? Science fiction horror TV show? Yes. Got to go with The Twilight Zone. Okay. That is just, it's the master. It's got it all. It's never been surpassed. You know, uh, you know I love Jordan Peele. His remake didn't do it for me. It just didn't. Rod Serling's original is, it's just a master class in cosmic dread of so many of the stories center around a sense of insignificance a sense of smallness of helplessness of of being at the mercy of forces that are not only more powerful than you but they're beyond your comprehension yep that, that you're you are a speck of dust facing gods mm-hmm. um and it, you know so many of the characters were quote unquote regular folks it was usually just a person going about their day and then all of a sudden they're the lone survivor of a nuclear holocaust or they're on a spaceship being prepped for dinner or something you know or um suddenly all the lights go off in the town or they find out that they've been a mannequin this whole time and now it's their time to turn back into plastic i'm just mentioning a couple classic episodes wrapped Um, in plastic that's a different show but um yeah the the twilight zone though it is it's also it still holds up i've recently watched it yeah um we're talking a show that is you know 50 60 years old at this point and it is still effective yeah I mean, you can Google like the top 10 Twilight Zone episodes. Oh, yeah, there's a those. lot. I mean, it was on for years and then there's a lot. And you know what? Honestly, if, if you if you like the Twilight Zone, go on to watch Night Gallery, which was Rod Serling's more horror centric series that came later. Mm. Um, it's also fantastic. But for for sci fi horror with a real bent towards um, pinpointing just how easy it is to destroy humanity <laughs> right? Um, or have ha- humanity destroy itself can't go better can't go better well the last thing i'm taking on the penis rocket is gonna be my tv series stranger things oh that's a good one so just for those of you that have not even paid attention to anything at all tv related for the last part of a decade um stranger things is set in 19 in the 80s in Hawkins, Indiana, um, and it's got an alternate dimension called the Upside Down, mm. and there's a human experimentation facility that is a gateway between the Upside Down and the real world, and these, you know, high school students are the ones that are really going to save Hawkins. Yeah. Oh, it's got a real. Or Stephen, are they? It's got a real Stephen King vibe. Uh, yeah, it's a battle against good and evil. It's got Light Winona Ryder. Um, it's kickstarted a lot of Millie careers Bobby too. Brown. Yeah, Millie Bobby Brown, uh, David Harbor. It's really it was his big breakout. The music is incredible. It's gotten scarier and scarier. And it's coming it's to a conclusion. It's um, amazing. One more season, I think, is is going to wrap it up. Yeah, and so, I think that's perfect. I mean, we've obviously, we've already seen the last season because, uh, I don't know if you know this, but rich people like us, we get to watch all TV shows that's not way true. before they come out, way before regular people. Like, we've already seen the ending of House of the Dragon. Uh, he's lying, everyone. It all. <clears throat> we watch lying. it on our rich person island that only rich people know about. But I would say anything that, you know, resonated with you, check it out. Um, get your ray guns, get your Tesla coils. If you want to up your horror game ante and add sci-fi to it, or if you want to raise your sci-fi love and add horror to it, we got a lot of recommendations Either way, out and there. listen, it's going to happen, okay? Everyone ends up there eventually. Jason ends up in space. Pinhead ended up in space. Leprechaun ended up in space make enough movies you're eventually going to space 
So make yourself a peanut butter and jelly today mm. and watch some face suckers. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Terror and Tandem is written, produced, and recorded by Laura and Richard Mathiason, and edited and mixed by Richard Mathiason. Our theme was written and performed by Carrie Denver, and all other music was written and performed by David Suspanic. All opinions expressed on this podcast are our own and should be taken as such. Thanks for listening, and please remember to give us a like, a review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Where's that?